That's at six o'clock, so I will call the March 29th meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Viana, would you please call the roll? Absolutely. Debbie Moore? Present. Patrick Connell? Here. Cynthia Meyer? Here. Richard Gartman? Here. Matt Lassen? Here. Sherilyn? Here. And Diana Rose should be on her way, and we've heard from Alyssa Hallie Schramm and Ms. Sue Ann Fruget that they're not going to be in attendance. Have we gotten any information about uh, the new board member, the new little baby board member? Super healthy, super cute, super bouncy. We super want pictures. Okay. <laughs> and I see, I see Diana walking through the door. Alrighty. Item two, comments to be heard from the audience on any topic not listed on the agenda, not to exceed three minutes in length. To address the commission, please submit a fully completed um, request card to the secretary. Seeing no one here, we will uh, go on to item number three since we have no, no citizens to comment. Hello. Um, items for individual consideration. Item 3A, consider action to approve meeting minutes from the February 22, 2018 Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting and the March 6, 2018 special meeting. Have you all had a chance to look over them? Are there any additions, corrections, deletions? Motion to approve as is. Motion to approve by Mr. Connell. Second. Second by Cheryl. Any opposition? Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Item 3B, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of the amendments to Chapter 14 of the Bastrop Code of Ordinances, Article 14.03, Historic Landmark Preservation to the City Council. Good Appeal. evening. So we are here with an item that was forwarded from the Historic Landmark Commission. Uh, to give you a little background on what we're looking at, um, in 1998 was the first adoption of Section 14.03, Historic Landmark Preservation, which created um, the pre uh, preservation requirements and the Historic Landmark Commission. Uh, the last ordinance update was done on October 23, 2007, um, which created, uh, I believe the incentives uh, were the main thing that was created with that uh, update. There was a major revision uh, drafted in 2009, and that went through, uh, the Historic Landmark Commission worked on it. Uh, it came to PNZ and was recommended uh, for approval to council, and it got to council, and there was, for various reasons, it did not get adopted at City Council, and it was early 2010. Um, so that kind of brings us to now. Um, this is one of the council goals is to strengthen our historic preservation efforts and to do that uh, updating our ordinance is uh, the way to do that additionally uh, the city would like to apply for it's called certified local government status and the certified local government program is through the texas historical commission and uh, you have to meet specific criteria to qualify for that program and then once you do um, you're able to use some services that the uh, texas historical commission provides and one of those things is also um, they do offer a grant program that helps you with your historic preservation efforts, be it surveys or design guidelines or other different uh, projects that cities do um, in their downtowns and other um, historic areas. Uh, so to start this effort this year, the Historic Landmark Commission used the previous 2009 draft, which had a lot of good um, information to start with, and then the recommendations from the Certified Local Government Program Manager um, to revise the existing ordinance. I'll have an extra slide in there. Uh, so generally, uh, we have the, the first section is general requirements uh, for his, historic preservation. Uh, we have updated definitions, and uh, we also changed uh, the, the, added some flexibility for the Historic Landmark Commission. Right now they have very specific uh, rules on what e who has to be in each position and should we not be able to find someone this gives council um, the ability to appoint someone that's knowledgeable that doesn't necessarily meet that um, you know real estate agent or 
uh, th those very specific criteria. Additionally, um, one of the positions that's required uh, by the state and national is a, a historic preservation officer. And currently, it is assigned to be the chair of the commission. And this would move that position to staff, which is a recommended recommendation of the state. In uh, the next section is categories of preservation. And currently, um, there are two categories. There's significant designations and historic landmark designations in town. Um, they, they require much of the same criteria. The, di the main difference between the two is that historic landmarks actually at, at present sign, sign a document committing to be a historic landmark and to come to the city for all uh, certificate of appropriateness reviews. Uh, whereas the significant designations do not have to do that and they don't get the plaque to put on their house. Um, so in this, uh, that, that's very confusing both for staff, citizens, and the state found that confusing <laughs> in our code. So we've removed the significant designation and just gone down to historic landmarks for specific uh, sites and structures. Additionally, we've created a process for designating historic districts. So this would give the commission the ability to outline a specific area in town, take that to council and get it adopted. Uh, certain boundaries like the historic Main Street, is a, there's a national uh, district over that right now. We could adopt a local district that we could then tie to other criteria um, when people are making additions or infill or other changes to that area. And what you do with that is you get design guidelines. That would be the next step to those historic districts that would give you the guidance for what the historical period for those areas are. Um, we also uh, created a process, we revised the process for the designation of uh, landmarks. Currently the process, it goes to HLC, comes to y'all, and then goes to city council. Um, in, to streamline this process a little bit, for just the landmarks, it'll go to HLC and then straight to city council without coming to PNC. Um, gives them a little bit more authority and, and cuts out another meeting for the applicant. We also created a process for removal of historic landmarks. Um, right now it's just if people try to withdraw, we don't really have any strict criteria of what that, that looks like. So this would um, create um, the criteria for the board to, to evaluate whether or not they should be removed from the list and it would have to have a two-thirds approval of city council to approve that removal. Uh, it also creates the process for designating historic district. In this one, this, this becomes a, a zoning overlay, essentially. So once the boundaries are defined, that would come to PNZ for review of that historic district and then go to city council for adoption and then that district would be reflected on our zoning map. The, we also have um, a process for removal of a historic district which would require 51% of the owners of real property within that district to petition the city to uh, request that removal. And additionally, two thirds of council would have to approve. So we currently have a process for certificate of appropriateness. Uh, the, the update, um, clarifies when it's required for a site, a structure, or a sign. And then uh, currently that'll be for historic landmarks. Once we adopt districts, then that can be applied within th those districts. It defined specific exemptions. What doesn't need a certificate of appropriateness? So does painting your house need one? No. If you need to replace some boards on your front porch, that does not. So ordinary maintenance, those kind of things do not need a certificate of appropriateness. If you're adding on a new front porch to the front of your house, that would. So those, those major changes that could affect the, um, the look and feel or the historic quality of the structure would have to have a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, we also define the application procedure and reference the fee schedule, which we had not done previously. We also created a specific process for a certificate of appropriateness for demolition or relocation. So demolition is demolishing the house entirely, it tear it down. Relocation can be either moving in or moving out a house into uh, the downtown or a district. 
this is important because when you start moving houses around, you can lose your historic character. Uh, if you move a, a house from another part of Texas that's historic, but not historic to Bastrop, that can, kind of, that can play with um, the look and feel and confuse people on when you're trying to figure out the date of that house because it's 100 years old, but it's only five years old to Bastrop. Additionally, we, if someone's moving a house out of Bastrop, that would, would possibly need to be reviewed. Uh, there are um, exemptions for unsafe buildings was moved to the exemption section. So if the building official deems the structure as unsafe, that does um, overrule the COA process. So one of the things that is in our current code is an incentive for designating your house as a historic landmark. Uh, this is a property, a property tax rebate that you get once a year and it's um, Currently, there's kind of a complicated calculation that's in the code. Um, we revised the section to, um, it, it's based off of your, your amount, your evaluation of historic uh, property, and then based off of what city council budgets each year for that refund. Uh, currently, there are no fees adopted for any of our uh, certificate of uh, appropriateness or our um, consideration of landmarks. Uh, this looking at how exhaustive the process is for staff and um, the, what it goes into that, um, we're proposing uh, for historic landmark designation consideration a hundred dollar fee, a removal of historic landmark or district three hundred dollars, a certificate of appropriateness uh, fifty, and for a pro certificate of appropriateness for demolition or relocation would be a hundred. The Historic Landmark Commission reviewed the current draft at their meeting on February 21st and forwarded it on to PNZ uh, for your review and recommendations to City Council. Uh, the next step is if PNZ recommends approval, it'll go to the April 10th City Council meeting. Uh, if you have some significant revisions, I would recommend that you, you send it back to the Historic Landmark Commission for. Um, that their consideration of those changes and their input if uh, for those changes. Any questions? So as far as moving the historic preservation officer to a staff position, that's a salaried position with the staff? It would be, so a, it would be a current staff member. It's, it's typically the planning director. Okay, so yeah. someone already within there. Yeah, it's not a new position. It would be a new task for us, an already existing staff member. And then what, what exactly is the difference? Because I know right now you, you say a homeowner applies for historic landmark status, but then we're talking about overlay neighborhoods that could then enforce a design standard. Mm -hmm. What really, if, if an overlay neighborhood's created, what's really the distinction between a homeowner who's elected to be a historic site versus everyone who's kind of compelled to be historic? <laughs> So a lot of that uh, gets determined when you develop design guidelines. So at present, we don't have, once this is, gets adopted, we still won't have any historic districts and we won't until we adopt those. And with each historic district, we will need to also adopt um, design guidelines or design standards. Additionally, we'll want to do a survey of each of those neighborhoods to define contributing and non-contributing structures, so things that add to the historic character and those that do not. Because if something does not add to the historic character, then it doesn't matter if you uh, change that, you know, add on, uh, dem demol I can talk, demolish that structure. But it's the historic ones within that uh, district. Uh, how the design guidelines are drafted and that'll kind of depend on how, what gets done. So one of the main things, so like infill. So right now there's nothing to control other than our zoning regulations what a house looks like. Um, so historic districts could uh, potentially regulate infill. So when you're, when an area is being considered for a historic district, is this, you know, citizen comments, people come in and is where everyone's got to say and yes. standards and whether it's actually accepted. And everyone in that, everyone that's going to be within the boundaries of that district will be notified during that public hearing process. That a they're, to object yes, or, that they'll potentially be in that district. So and that'll be a that'll be a city initiated process um, when we start looking at those. 
districts, and those and those district boundaries are usually defined by kind of like like periods, like construction standards, all those kind of things. Uh, but yes, there will be a lot of public <laughs> opportunity to speak because they'll have to come to P and Z for public hearing and have to go to city council. Yeah, and then anyone's got a question? As far as uh kind of the incentive is concerned you know reading the first paragraph of the section 14 mm -hmm. you know it, it puts forth this great idea that we're here to preserve the heritage of you know people who have grown up in the area and so when they come back to Bastrop you know they kind of always feel like they're coming to their hometown so it seems like the city has a pretty strong desire to preserve that but yet as you kind of mentioned this semi tax refund the isn't really defined in any great way that I've heard just seems rather a weak incentive to get someone to voluntarily you know you know they say they want to partner with citizens in preserving mm -hmm. the area but all this seems like it's on the citizens to make sure it's preserved not necessarily the city helping them to do other than imposing standards is there any talk about increasing incentive or at least defining what the incentive is so people can get a guaranteed know what's going to happen not not at present so currently in the in the code what is defined at is that the incentive is somewhere between it has to be between 0.15 percent to 0.22 percent of the total valuation of the historic structure and then the based off of that that base that's your guidelines and then the city budget somewhere in that that range usually is what happens so the last last year the percentage people got back was 0.17 this year they're getting right at the 0.15 because property uh, property taxes went up, or property valuations went up quite a bit this last year um, so but the, the average um, the, the incentive has been somewhere between two hundred dollars up to for some of the commercial properties over a thousand dollars per structure so that's where we I think intend to try to keep it at that target but it is council could choose not to budget that line item at all so that because that's how it's currently funded is every year the city council budgets an amount to go to that program so I don't know if that's really answered your question but <laughs> It's, no, it is. It's just it, yeah. the same thing. It's just a rather weak incentive, it seems. Mm -hmm. I know that speaking with many people, and again, I don't know Houston standards or anything like that, but other cities have very strong kind of programs in order to get people to voluntarily take on this task of preserving our heritage. And, you know, if, if it's a value to the city to mm -hmm. have an old historic home, there should be a, a pretty easy equation to put a monetary thank you to that as we're going to force you to you know get siding milled a certain way here's a little extra money to help you with that mm -hmm. for beautifying our town so anyway just out of, it was more yeah. curiosity yeah and I can add that comment to uh, the report when it goes to city council I just wanted to get some clarification <clears throat> so we talked about how like if you know you're repairing simple maintenance mm -hmm. is you know doesn't require anything uh, to what extent do we include maintenance you know, like if I have a cracked single old single pane window and I want to replace it uh, you know to be more efficient or something mm -hmm. like that would that be considered something that needed approval or is that still kind of within the maintenance realm or how does that if you're, if you're replacing with like things they, they would smile it, like it's me. considered <laughs> maybe Dave has something no, no, go ahead. Oh, is this a, if you're replacing with the, a like um, product so if you're replacing a column that's rotted out with the same type of style of column or the same type of window, then that's just ordinary maintenance. Does that have to be the same type of material or just look like? Typically, well, my experience has been look like right. the historic right. windows. So, And the reason I got up is windows replacements can be a problem sometimes. We want to make sure that they use a historically accurate, you know, window pane, you know, two over two right. instead of just a solid window like a lot of people want to put in for energy and, and they make energy efficient w uh, windows that match the style it's right just we need to make sure that they do that. that that's why I picked it as an example it's one of those things where it's like you, you know you redo all the windows but it, it tends to be an upgrade and um, hey, correct me if I'm wrong somebody correct me if I'm wrong the the rebate was not so much as an incentive to do it as much as it was the city trying to kick back and getting you to use that money to 
maintain the yeah. home. Is that what is that? Not I think intense? that was the original intention. The rebate's right? not and it's so much an incentive to like yeah. designate your home. It's more like we'd like you to keep it looking nice. So, mm. you know, take this thousand dollars you normally pay in taxes and put it towards maintaining the house. So um, I think calling it incentive or it's a little bit misleading if that's how we're phrasing it. It's, it's more of like a, you know, maintenance rebate than anything. So. And uh, the chair of the Historic Landmark Commission is also here. If you have any historical questions <laughs> that go back uh, to the creation of the HLC. Any other members have questions? I just have one that's kind of an unusual question, but um, what if a property owner that in an area that would be a district um, had buildings and either they were there, they were moved in, they weren't historical, but a sign was put up by the owner that said historical district. The, the owner would, just puts up a district? Yeah, what the, would, would that just confuse, I mean, it could stay and just confuse everyone that... Yeah, it wouldn't be an officially adopted anything they could right. put up they, their that would sign, just be but them we, labeling it themselves. Yeah. And we do have um, our own, we do have city plaques that for the local uh, historic landmarks, we, when they are designated as a landmark, they do get that plaque to put on their right. house. So we have an official right. plaque. And then right now we do have um, the street signs that say historic district, mm -hmm. even though we don't technically have a historic district, it's a general historic district. But I would imagine as we start to designate those historic districts, we will uh, brand each one of those neighborhoods with new street signs that identify those districts. So. I think if people want, I mean, we can't really stop people from putting up fake, right. their, own, their own interpretation of things, but that won't be something that's represented in our office. Right. We do have several methods. We've talked about it extensively in the Historic Landmark Commission about how to make sure people know their properties are historic landmarks or that they're in the district. And we have one of the things that we're going to we do is we record um, the historic landmark designation at the uh, with the county clerk's office, so it does pull up with your title search. And then um, our zoning maps will reflect any historic districts. So that's uh, so people should know if they're really in one or not. So, do, are there any? Uh, do, does does it contain any exemptions, or is it a problem to solve? But does it, are there any exemptions for current homeowners in a district who are not historical but would have to rebuild? For example, if my home's not historical but it burns down and now I have to build new, mm -hmm. would I be subject to the? historical building requirements would I be exempt uh, what if I had to you know what if building to the host historical requirements put me over a budget to rebuild yeah. my home you know and, and whatnot and we, is there an we exemption? Don't, we don't have those requirements yet so that's the that's this next step in this process right now we're just creating the ability to create a historic district okay we don't we don't we don't have a city historic district for any part of town yet so w during that process, that'll be one of the things that gets, that I'm sure will get debated and discussed, is to what extent are we gonna make people match the period? Uh, does it ha some, some cities don't require infill to follow, in, in especially in the residential neighborhoods. And sometimes those things, like in our form-based code currently, we don't require you to follow a specific historical standard, but we do require you to add on features that match kind of that, the look and feel of downtown front porches, or awnings on your windows basic things that kind of dress up your house but aren't necessarily to a specific period so uh, i th we'll be looking at that full so, range of things so are we saying that each historic district overlay would have to have that type of provision in it yes and, and so would it not make more sense then to just put it in the in this what we're looking at so it applies to all those districts for, for a situation like that or, or an exemption that might apply everywhere I don't Not everywhere, but to all historic <laughs> districts. Yeah, I, I think that's going to, two things are going to determine that. One is uh, what the district is and why you're designating that as district, and then what design guidelines you want to impose and who you're going to impose that on. Actually, as a matter of fact, and something you all have adopted since the last time this was discussed, the form based code, to a large extent, creates buildings that are roughly compatible. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily, we may or may not want to require all new buildings to look 100 years old. We just want to make sure that they're the same size, uh, massing, uh, and general shape. And the form-based code already does that to a large extent. Okay. Uh, most of the design guidelines really apply to what do you do to the historic buildings that are already there. Okay. 
that you don't strip off the historic uh, uh, commercial facade and throw up a 1980s style right. facade. Right. Okay. Thanks. So just just to make sure I understand. So for instance, if his house was on a street where all the houses are craftsman style house, mm -hmm. his burned down, but maybe his wasn't that style before. Would he be then, would it be compelled upon him to now build a craftsman style new house so that he, his house now matches the rest of the homes in the, on that street or in that district? I don't think that he would be compelled to have to build to that style because the design guidelines, a well-crafted set of design guidelines, will give you options of different, it, it kind of gives you a scope without having to design your house for you. So as it would more make sure that instead of, if, you have, if your 1,500 square foot house burned down, it would more keep you from building a 4,000 square foot house in that place that dwarfs the houses next to it. That's, more, that's what it would control rather than the strict way it looked. Is that, you kind of see, especially coming out of Austin, you've seen that where... Uh, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Anyone else? I'll accept a motion. A motion to approve as is, send it to council. Is there a second? second? The motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll adjourn the regular meeting and go into. You're, you're jumping out of your seat. You want to say something before we go no, to workshop? No, no, no. Okay. All right. All right. We adjourn the regular meeting and go into workshop. So item four. Four A is to dis discussion and update on the draft subdivision ordinance. Mr. Gaddis. Well, as my kids would always say, are we there yet? Yeah. We're, we're getting closer. So uh, we had uh, our, our last workshop, the uh, first of the month on March 6th. Uh, where we looked at the second half of the ordinance. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about what revisions I've made to the ordinance since then. And I, what you have in your packet is up to date with the exception of a couple of things that I caught. And I'll uh, talk about those. Uh, and then also you'd ask for an executive summary. Uh, and somebody threw out five pages. And I don't know how, why you were so astute at that, but it turned out to be five pages long. So that was included. So uh, that, that's in your packet to, to look at. Uh, and then we'll use that primarily to uh, talk to other people about it so they don't have to read all 150 pages. They can just look at the five pages. Uh, Joint City Council PNZ work session has still not yet been scheduled. I am still pushing to try to get something uh, on board. Uh, but we have made a little progress. Uh, I do have authorization to talk to the county. And the county is one of the first people I was going to reach out to anyway. As it turns out, they reached out to me because even though it's not public, it's public because it's on your agenda. So. You know, there have been quite a few people that have been following along, and the county was one of those. So they want to talk about uh, some items specifically on parkland dedication, because we are now requiring parkland dedication in the ETJ uh, outside our city with the idea that if we're going to annex those areas, we want to make sure that there's parks there to handle that. But it gets into the issue of who's going to maintain those parks. Uh, as it's currently written, we've got it set up for an HOA to manage them, uh, but it may be make more sense to have the county or the city do that. And actually, it may be different regulations in different parts of the ETJ. And we'll talk about some other issues that they have. So we we'll, uh, do have a meeting scheduled th with them next Wednesday, and we'll probably go through the ordinance fairly thoroughly and kind of pick up on some of the things that they may have. And once I can get the, the, the meeting scheduled with the council, then the plan would be to reach out to home builders, developers, and the public to start getting input from them. So let's talk about what we've done since uh, March 6th. Uh, one of the first things was to establish a threshold for platting. The question came up, do, are we going to make everybody, uh, and this is getting away from the lot of record, to a plat, what would actually trigger that? 
So just to put some numbers in, I put for new buildings or building additions less than 125 square, square feet. So you could put a small shed in your backyard. If you're going to build a big shed or you're going to make a big addition to your house, then that's probably going to trigger the planning process. Uh, we would exempt fences, signs, or flat work. Uh, we the, real quick does that does that also tie into? I know we talked about it. Like if I need to get an electrical permit. None yeah. of that stuff. yeah if, if you don't if you don't change the footprint or you only change the footprint 120 square feet or less it doesn't require planning yeah okay thank you um, we did put a, a reference in there on the title search when uh, we're showing uh, easements and stuff on plants uh, you know part of the idea of platting is so that we can get all the uh, recorded easements shown on the plat so people know what's going on we had a uh, an issue not too long ago where somebody came in and planted and forgot to put on a drainage easement which rendered one of their lots completely useless and so uh, we want to just kind of reassure that they've gone through a title search to make sure that that's been done. 500 year flood zone. We had talked last time about extending some regulations into the 500 year and what we were talking about at that time was to we have a two foot free board right now uh, 100 year flood, we call that the base flood elevation. And then we, as a free board, we require that houses be built two feet above that so that if the flood gets up to the 100 year, you still have some protection to your house. The plan was to have two foot of free board in the 100 year, and then we would do a one foot free board in the 500 year for a, period, uh, for a distance of uh, 100 feet or so. And I got to thinking about that, and that really didn't make sense. Because what you end up is two foot above the BFE near the river, and then you have houses that are only one foot above. So they actually be lower, and so they would be at greater risk. So what I've done is I've rewritten it to say it'll be two foot above the BFE extending into the 500 year flood level. Now, uh, flood um, plain. Now, the 500 year flood may actually be big, more than two feet. But the two foot above provides a lot more protection to homes than what we're currently doing. And just as a reminder, FEMA doesn't require that you be anything above the 100 year flood and doesn't require any regulation in the 500. But so what we're doing, we're extending that two foot out into the 500. The way I came up with that was I had, uh, Harris County is actually requiring two feet above the 500 year flood level, which is actually pretty high but they just had a horrible event. Um, now the city of Houston was also considering a similar uh, regulation. It, they were supposed to vote on that this week, but they're getting a lot of pushback from their development community, so they have not voted on that. I think the, one, the, the two foot above the 100 year level is a, a reasonable step that helps provide better uh, protection. Dave, uh, I got a, qu a quick question for sure. you. On these uh, floodplains, 100 and years that FEMA sets, how often do they update them and can we request that they review them and update them based on changes? They, as a general rule, but not hard and fast, it's about every 10 years they get around to redoing it. And a big part of that's just funding for the federal. Um, we can pay to have them redone, but that can be a pretty significant expense. Um, and so what we do is in the interim, we do individual changes. Now, as it turns out, we do have a project going on where we're revising the, or looking at the flood model for Gills Branch and Piney Creek. And presumably those revisions will get incorporated into some amendments to the floodplain. But as far as doing citywide or countywide, it's usually about once every 10 years. Okay, so we, we'll, we can do isolated ones based on right. what we've learned and seen. Okay, thank you. And as developments occur, we do what are called conditional letters of map revision or CLOMERS or letters of map revision or LOMERS. Uh, we require developers to do those as a condition in, to develop. Anytime they're encroaching into the floodplain, we require them to update the flood maps. I want to jump in real quick because I, I see we're going by page numbers and so yep. there's a, and it's not up here, but um, we added a definition of legal lot of record, which yes. is great. Um, my, suggestion or what I want thoughts from everybody is adding a definition for an illegal lot because um, the questions come up you know so illegal lot is something that that we use when we talk about this stuff but I think if if somebody calls up the office and they're like well your lots illegal the question is is well how is it how is it illegal because I've 
pay to have it surveyed and it's got its own tax ID number and whatnot, how is it illegal? Okay. And while I realize that the, the definition of illegal may be exactly the opposite of right. legal law of record, I'm just wondering if it's worth adding to, for clarification yeah. for, for the average citizen user of, of, of Yeah, we, we can do that. Same issue we have sometimes with plat. Right. You know, I got a plat when I bought the property. Well, that's not a plat that the city recognizes. Right. Plat just means plat. So, so at least that way, when okay. we tell somebody it's an illegal lot, there's a definition yeah. of that, and they can go and check that and say, oh, okay, well, that, I, I see what we're getting at. So. Somebody going to that, jot that down? Uh, back when we were talking about low-impact development, uh, you, you all raised the question of having some more teeth to require that. So if you recall, I had kind of a a list of about a dozen different things that they could do and basically I'm just saying developer try to do at least two of those so give them the flexibility to try to see what they can incorporate as far as low impact development uh, there was a question about wildfire zones and what applied as a wildfire zone so I make I have a reference to the uh, Texas A&M uh, Forest Service Texas Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal, which actually defines areas of risk for, for, for fire. So uh, it, you can go to that and see where in the city uh, applies to that, and then we will we'll put those on our planning maps. Uh, a lot of discussion about street naming procedures, and while I was going through the ordinance, I discovered that we had street naming in two different spots, so I ended up combining the two. Uh, and. Uh, kind of corrected the proper process to do that and then gave some flexibility with the ultimate authority uh, at staff level. Uh, did want to make sure that you all knew that we were revising the standard pavement design that we were requiring for asphalt streets. Uh, currently we only require one and a half inches of asphalt on eight inches of base material and that's pretty minimal. That's rural county road standards. So I'm putting in a more common uh, city standard of uh, six inches of asphalt. It's, it's two inches of one type of asphalt and then four inches of the other. Uh, go ahead. Does that include any repaving that the city does on current streets? We will generally apply our own standards to ourselves. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Just want to make sure. Having said that, I'm not in charge of the public works department. <laughs> Generally. <laughs> uh, page 100. That was the big one that you all wanted me to look at. Was some standards for uh, private streets. So I've added a whole new section on private streets and gated communities. Uh, and some of you have picked up that I borrowed that from a previous city I worked at and. In fairness, I probably wrote it back when I was there, so I'm not sure it was copyright infringement. Um, but it, it provides for where you can do uh, private streets and gated communities, um, what kinds of design requirements. In particular, we're looking at the gates and entry areas. Uh, make sure that when you pull into a private street that you have a way to get out, because sometimes you pull into some of these places and you get out, back out because you can't get through the gate. Um, addressing how to convert public streets to private streets and then private streets back to public streets because that can get kind of thorny sometimes um, and then how that those streets get maintained and so what we're requiring is that each of the HOAs uh, have a, a road maintenance reserve fund uh, that we require minimum contributions to and then we have the right to audit that so that if there is a road failure we know that they have the funds to be able to fix it and they don't suddenly start coming to the city and say hey come fix it for us. That was a big change so if you got questions I'm happy to look at those. Actually David just a comment as I read through it as I remember our discussion last time about uh, should we even consider this I think what you've got in there gives us the option as a city if we think it's appropriate you've given us a mechanism to put it in place if we want to either existing ones going private or private ones going in so i think it's a nice section of wording you put in there thank you okay yeah you as part of the planning process you can decide whether you would want to allow private streets or not okay going on I did put some provisions in there for alternate driveway design and uh, late, a little later on we talk about alternate driveway paving uh, question has come up is do we really need 
In fact, I think your current ordinance calls for 14 foot wide concrete paving for, or asphalt paving for all residential driveways. This gives a little bit of flexibility that you could do the two track paving if you wanted, and then you could actually look at some alternate paving types. Um, again, the city engineer would be the one reviewing those. Uh, page 112, we're addressing rural sidewalk maintenance. Um, again, this is out in the county in the ETJ. Uh, city wouldn't be maintaining it. Well, the county doesn't want to maintain it e either. So just provisions for if you do sidewalks or if you do pedestrian systems, that that's part of the HOA's responsibility. David, on your, on your driveway section there on page 108, uh -huh. um, one of the question kind of came up was I went back and read that one again. And it, it gets into the discussion about two car with two car driveways. And I know last time they said, well, if it's tandem, yeah, so you've got a single door. I'm almost wondering if we ought to put something in there that says the driveway must be wide enough to accommodate the, the width of the, the doors and the vehicles so somebody doesn't stick an undersized drive on there where two cars can barely fit, people are stepping off into plants. Well, I'm not sure that that's not their choice. Okay. You know, if it was me, I would probably want to be able to step out onto a sidewalk or something like that. But uh, what we're trying to do is give some flexibility so that we're not requiring a lot of pavement when it may not be desired or necessary. Yeah, because I know it's in the single car section, it said 11 for a single car. Then we get to two car, it says 11 up to 24. I'm going, okay, the upper end works, but if someone's got a 16 foot wide garage door and they're going, oh, I only need 11 feet. Are we setting ourselves up for an issue there? I conceivably, but it's probably okay. not likely. Okay. I feel like that's kind of like a free market thing. Like the builder yeah. does something, or a developer does something stupid like that, people are going to notice and go, <laughs> I think I want to move there. And, and then part of that driveway width is really to address the width of the driveway at the street. We don't yeah. want a situation where they have their entire street frontage is a drive approach coming in. There are some people who try to do that. We want to narrow that down to the minimum necessary to be able to serve their particular okay. drive. Uh, page 113, we talked about, I have a threshold for what it would take to upgrade parking lots. And so if you're just going to redo your parking lot, fine, go ahead and redo it. If you're going to add on to your building by 10% or more, we want you to bring it up to at least current standards. And there are some alternate paving lot uh, provisions in there now. Uh, but we have some people who really don't have any pavement on their parking lots. And so at some point in time, we want to trigger at least uh, to bring that up. So I heard somebody say that, you know, driving through potholes in a parking lot was part of the experience. So maybe that's, that gets to the free market too, I guess. But anyway, we're, 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 we're adding a threshold, but we're giving a lot of flexibility. Uh, 120, we talked about revising the minimum finished floor elevation of the 500 year flood. And you'll notice at the very beginning of the ordinance, a lot of the stuff we're putting in here really needs to be reflected in other parts of the code. And so we do have a flood damage prevention ordinance. So this reference to uh, minimum four elevation needs to be incorporated in that. Likewise, when we talk about clearing out the forest, uh, air, the 30 foot buffer zone, that really needs to be in the uh, nuisance section, et cetera. Page 126, uh, added more teeth to the runoff quality treatment. Uh, if you recall there, I had a list of about eight or nine different things that you could do for runoff quality. Again, that's not legally required that you address runoff quality, but we're trying to do a more environmentally sustainable, it's kind of the right thing to do. And so basically of those eight or nine, you know, just try to do one. And it may or may not work, but at least the engineer will have a chance to look at that. And then on 149, you know, I'd mentioned the dark sky ordinance. Well, that's really a section called uh, exterior lighting standards that's in the zoning ordinance. So I've made that proper reference back. I am going to update that section because we now reference uh, LED lights as our lighting standard. And then the rest of the text talks about high pressure sodium or low pressure sodium. And so I want to make sure that we have the right numbers in the right place. 
Yeah, it's. I remember last time we got into this discussion was like, it's what's there, what do we really have and what's need? It triggered me and I started doing some research into street lightings and high pressure sodiums and LEDs and uh, what I found is cities are all over the map on this one. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I found consistent and it, it was kind of almost a lessons learned that some cities did it and they had to go back and redo it. They went in and stuck in the bright white LED lights and then they went, uh, yes, this works, but this is really ugly in my city and they had to go back and change them. I think what we need to specify is LEDs, but specify what they call amber LEDs. And these are in the, the, the and they use this designation of, of K, 2200K to 3000K, which kind of brings them out of that bright white down more towards that amber or yellow. So it looks more like kind of what we have here in the downtown area, lights that are in that range, but they're the LEDs. And maybe I think what we want to do is, is go in that direction, say LEDs, we call them the amber LEDs and define them that way. Yeah, I've ordered some design manuals from the Illumination Engineering Society uh, and two of them. One is on just street lighting standards and then they also have a, a design guideline on basically doing dark sky ordinance yeah. lighting. So between those two I hope that we can get to. And just as a kind of reference if you want to just kind of drive around and look at street lights. Uh, used to be everything was mercury vapor and they're kind of a bluish tint. Uh, then they went to uh, low pressure sodium, which is kind of a orange tint, and then the high pressure sodium is kind of a yellow tint. Cities were doing that change because they're increasingly more efficient, but uh, they have different lighting stand. I mean, but a lot of people don't like the orange and yellows because it kind of washes people out at night. And uh, but but we'll take a look at that. Yeah, it actually, if the the newest section of Hunter's Crossing has the high pressure or has the LED bright whites in them. Yeah. So, and the old section has the older high pressure sodium lights in it. So, I mean, right there in one area you can see the contrast between the two. So, that's where we're at. Um, like I said, I'll start meeting with the county next week and then hopefully we can schedule that joint meeting with the council and then we can do some public outreach and be moving ahead. But I'm open for questions at this point. Well, I, for one, want to thank you and Jennifer and the staff for the hard work and the many hours that you've put into this. And I also want to congratulate this commission for the six hours that we've put into this, the research that's been done between meetings, and um, I think we've come up with an excellent product that the city will be able to use and the county in the years to come. That will make sure that we have the kind of city that we want and the, the tail doesn't wag the dog. And I want to thank you. Yeah. And please let the, um, the council know that this commission has worked very hard to get through this in a timely manner and we're just waiting on them. We're not pushing, okay. but we haven't voted on every, anything yet, but um, we're waiting for the city. We've done our work. Thank okay. you. I'll pass that Anything on. else? I, I did have, well, I, I don't have a question, but I was given a question by somebody else in discussing mm -hmm. this. So I'm going to ask you so you can, uh, you can answer it. Um, how did these apply to somebody doing something on their house that they currently have that's already in existence within the city? Like if I wanted to redo my driveway or I wanted to, you know, redo the sidewalk or something like that, how mm -hmm. would that apply to those people, well, if at all? Obviously, this ordinance doesn't apply until you adopt it. So the current regulations are what currently apply. I'm sorry. So. When this is when this when the final draft goes into effect, would this uh, would this affect anything that's current or only new stuff? Well, like I said, it's really the triggers that I mentioned earlier. That depending on what they did, if they're just doing flat work or they're just putting up a small shed or a fence or something like that, this really doesn't apply to them. Okay. I just have one question. Um, when this is posted for public to see, mm -hmm. alongside that, does it also let them know that there will be time in the future for public comment? Because I've heard a lot of people commenting, mm -hmm. and um, I want them to be sure t that they know they do have a chance to do that. Will that be on the site also? Yeah. Well. When we put out the formal mm -hmm. notice, uh, it'll be in preparation of some public meetings. Good. So. 
Anything else? Thank you. Four B discussion on the draft mobile food vendor ordinance. Yippee. <laughs> we don't need subdivision ordinance no, yet. No, we're, we're in workshops and either of these items. It's just in items. workshops, so we don't take any action in workshops. Yeah. This is just for information and discussion, but yeah, no action. So the item we're talking about tonight is mobile food vendors. So as uh, the city gets a lot of requests for these. People, um, they're a popular business model. Um, they do serve as an incubator for future restaurants. Uh, so we have a lot of interest of in people setting up in different spots around town. Uh, our current codes are not very clear and do not have um, concise standards of where they're allowed, how they're allowed, all those things. Our, our, we have a mobile, we have a vendors, peddlers, and solicitors section of the code that's about 20 some odd years old or more. And it more applies to people going door to door and doing those kind of activities, not necessarily mobile food, which is kind of a more intensive use. Um, so kind of in some of the background, this, some concerns you hear in other cities, this does compete sometimes with your existing brick and mortar restaurants. Um, and so that's another thing to keep in mind while we're looking at possible rules. So uh, the definition that we have of a mobile food vendor is any business that operates or sells food for human com consumption, hot or cold, from a non-stationary location within the city of Bastrop. So something that is able to move around from site to site. I actually managed to pull some pictures to make this a little more interesting. So we kind of define three different types of vehicles, structures for this. Uh, the first is your food truck, which is it's got a motor in it. It moves all by itself and can go from site to site. You have food trailers, which need a truck to pull them. And then your third category is your food or concession cart. That's your kind of typical hot dog cart or your ice cream cart that someone has to push around uh, or bike around without a motor. So we've, um, staff has looked at um, ordinances from across the state, um, Austin, Buda, College Station, uh, and we've kind of pulled from different ordinances some ideas. So this is just a rough draft. We're not bringing this forward for adoption. We've still got more discussion to have on this, but this is, we're throwing this out here and get to get everyone's feedback. Uh, so we have, we've set this up with the first criteria is general requirements. These would apply to all mobile food vendors. Uh, first one is zoning districts. Where are they allowed? And in the draft that I gave you, it defines specific zoning districts where they're allowed by right, which are typically where you already currently allow a restaurant use. Um, and then also specifically for the downtown areas where you do have commercial uses very close to residential, um, there are some requirements for a conditional use permit if someone chooses to do a concentrated food court of mobile food vendors. The, if anyone wants to locate on public property or a city right-of-way, that would require an additional level of city approval. So, so if someone wants to be in a city parking lot or park in the street, that would have to be approved um, through, a, through a separate level, usually with our public works or the parks, whoever, own, whoever manages that public or even the county lots. Those own, uh, property owners uh, would have to sign off. Uh, all trucks would need to follow state and county food and health rules. The county of Bastrop is the one who does all of our food inspection, restaurant inspection, so, and there's actually a specific code that covers mobile food vendors at the state level. Uh, employees must have food handler certificates. This is just something that we want to make sure that anyone operating a food truck, so not, so it's not just the person. We've had people that literally want to set up a camper in their front yard and have their kids sell hamburgers. That's not going to be something that's allowed. <laughs> uh, is this food handler, is this the Texas State Food Handler Certificate? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, must have a contract with an approved commissary. So what that means is you have to have all of your water and wastewater contained within the unit 
and you have to have a, a provider that comes and services that for you. So we don't want trucks, the, the idea is they need to be mobile. And if they are tapping into our water and wastewater, they are, not, they are no longer mobile. So they need to have those self-contained on the unit and have a contract with someone who's coming and refilling the water and disposing of the waste properly. Uh, proper ventilation and fire suppression will be required. And then uh, current state registrations and license plates for all vehicles that are associated with the truck. So a truck pulling the trailer, the food truck itself, all of those would need uh, to be current on their registrations. Jennifer, on the commissary, mm -hmm. um, how could that, how would we monitor that? Uh, so one of the requirements that we have in the current draft is that they would have to uh, get a 90-day uh, permit. So every 90 days they would need to turn that in to us to show they have an active contract. And they have a, have a contract with the commissary. Yes. And, and the commissary is really, you know, some people make their food on site, but there's a lot of people who get their food off site. Mm -hmm. And with the commissary is where they're getting that food from. So we yeah. want to make sure that it's been inspected and it's licensed as well. So it's not just water and wastewater, it's the food itself. So so could 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 H E could H E B be a commissary? If it registers with the state, yeah. Okay, okay. But, but if it but if it didn't then it wouldn't wouldn't be legal under this regulation. Okay. And for that matter it wouldn't be legal under the county regulations either. Okay. One question for you on the fires ventilation fire suppression. Does this fall under the fire codes for enforcement or, or would that be handled? It would be the, yeah, the fire, our fire code would be, our fire rules would be what governs, so. Okay. This is just something that comes to mind when I see these parks that are set up in Austin. So let's say you have an actual park that's set up for trailers and they have their own water and wastewater that is provided. So that's just something I wanted to throw out there. That was one of my considerations once we got down into the further into the ordinance was if you have a food court that's set up, you know, for that purpose that, you know, if you had like a universal tap for those types of things, it might. Yeah. Water and restrooms is the big issue with food trucks. And so uh, the requirements that we're proposing is that if there is a food truck park, they're ret required to have a a uh, restroom and water facility available not only for the employees but for the customers as well. Uh, if it's a standalone food truck, often people are not there long enough that we really need that, but we often need to have an agreement between the food truck and an adjacent business so that the employees have some place to go. So, yeah, that, that, that tends to be the big issue a lot. And the last requirement is that the units be self-contained. So, especially for a standalone unit, um, no additional add-ons that you're building on or pop-ups that get added to the site um, would be allowed. So, my only question with that is, if I had so to have a single vendor, you have to have an established business, mm -hmm. and they're just you know taking up space. If the established business has a storage something outside that they want to let them use, does that fall within? The, the, the way we've drafted it so far, that would be part of the primary business. So it would the, even it wouldn't if it's, fall even in. if that space is leased or used by just yeah, the single it would vendor. still be under the primary business's site plan and all and what they've had permitted. If that that group leaves, it will still stay there. I, I'm I'm it's mostly trying to get away from if you go out in the county, you see some pretty extensive structures that have been built where they they can pull the truck up to it, and I right I'm trying to get away from some of that or, that's fine i'm just making i'm just in my head i'm thinking yeah. of you know like if i store tables and chairs and everything else in a unit that's provided by the primary business would that fall underneath that that was it so then we've broken this down into two specific kind of uses the one is the single vendor that would go on an established uh, property site so it must be located on a private property that has an occupied primary business. So you'll see those often with a, a car wash or what we have, we have some around town that have been around for a while and they predate me. So I'm un, unsure exactly what processes all of those went through to <laughs> be located where they are. But um, so like with a car wash, you see those, they don't take up a lot of space. People eat there while they're getting their car washed. 
on, with a gas station. So they would have to be with a business that does have an active certi certificate of occupancy. If it's an, a vacant business, that wouldn't be allowed. Uh, some of the rules that cannot take up required parking. So if you only have two parking spots, they can't take up the only two parking spots on the whole lot. Uh, you can't locate in the required setbacks or the fire lanes. Uh, it must be located on a paved surface with additional space for walk up and park traffic. Got a question about that one. Mm -hmm. um, and I know further on there you talk about it can't be in parks either. But for the Patriotic Festival and I, th and I think also for the Halloween Fest, mm -hmm. they did have some, some vendors down there, some mobile vendors in Fisherman's Park. Could they get a special use permit or a one time permit? Yes. And, okay. So that's so and that's it would one be of the grass, so it wouldn't be in all in, in yeah. paved. And that's one of the things we're that we're still going to try to work out with the other departments is that we're dealing with the, the the private vendor who wants to go on private property. We will have probably additional steps for those city events or other um, public events that they'll go through a, a, the special event process, or even if the parks decide to contract with some kind of concession service that goes in the parks, that would be in addition to and would be able to work their permits specifically for those. Uh, electricity provided by a generator, so basically electricity not connected to the primary business. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here, so, mm -hmm. so, and I want everybody else's thoughts too. So as I'm reading through this, and I made all these my little notes, my preference would be to require connection to the primary business is electrical and my thought process is is that if you have a generator running on site um, you're, you're gonna do a couple things you're gonna I think you're gonna create some noise pollution for the current business um, I think if you are you know walk it up and you're gonna try and stay and enjoy a, a food you got that you know you got the generator running and if if we're requiring them to connect to you know have like a universal way to connect to that business and, and they can decide between the business and the vendor how they want to reimburse that or if they don't want to. Um, I, I, I see that as a benefit to creating like a nice, you know, enjoyable mm -hmm. place where you would want to eat where you're not hurting the, the you know, the current business and whatnot. Um, same thing for the food park as we get further into that one. You know, if you're going to, if we're going to have a food court design mm -hmm. for these structures, it makes sense to require those to hook up and not give them the option necessarily to run generators because if we have a food court of four or five trucks and everybody's mm -hmm. running a generator yeah it's you know um so that's that's my thought i don't know what anybody else thinks about it well i've been um to the magnolia market and she has a big yeah. food court with all mm -hmm. the vendor trucks and I, I maybe i just didn't notice but i don't remember generators and all of that for each of each of those trucks at, at all it seemed like it was a situation where Kind of like an RV park, you know, you can hook up and and you can, mm -hmm. you know, have have what you need for for power and for water and for um, uh, wastewater if necessary. Though so that's usually not right there anyway. Not only that, but my thought is 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 the noise mm -hmm. pollution not just for that current business but neighboring businesses yeah. as well. When you get into yeah. though, so if I had a truck next to a business. Um, I think that would be between the food truck and the business, but I, I, if it was my business and somebody, there was an extra piece of land there that somebody got a, a permit to use, I don't know that I would want them to hook up to my, my electricity. I think, I think that would be something that the two parties would have to determine. I don't think that it's favorable. I think in most cases the business probably wouldn't be favorable for it. For a food truck park, it's, it's makes different. sense to go ahead and right. put electrical hookups in there. For a single site where there's an existing business, that it may not be cost effective to run electrical, and I'm not sure that we want to have extension cords laying around all over the place. So uh, we can talk with the building official and see what kind of electric code requirements might be. But I would agree that this is not ideal for the business, but I think from the from like the community standpoint, you know, that's, you know, big sounds. I, I picture a generator that, you know, needs to run a bigger truck. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I picture the, the size and the sound that goes with that. And so if I'm set up legally on this piece of property and then this neighbor has to deal with it, you know, there, there's no real provision to, 
stop them, you know, or, or they call and it's a nuisance, and so you know the PD will shut them down because they're they're being a bother, and we kind of get up in this, you know, this, this weird. But wouldn't the tangle. business have to agree to it? To to allow them to use their electricity. Right, so so that would be part of a, a you know I would assume the business would have a lease with with any mobile vendor you know it's not just like hey pull up on a Saturday yeah. set up shop and do your thing I'm I'm sure there would be some type of agreement in place anyway who and so would then be that, responsible how so but then you would get into who pays for what part of the electricity but that's all that would be a private agreement that wouldn't have right. to be regulated by the city if if the if the business owner says hey you know. You pay me a hundred bucks each weekend, and we'll just include electricity. Or hey, you're going to pay me a hundred bucks plus fifty bucks for the electricity you're going to use for the weekend. That would be a private deal between them based on their agreement. I'm just, and it may not be favorable for the business, you know, to right. hook up. But I'm, I'm thinking not so much what's good for the business, but what's going to be good for the people that are around that area, especially if we're setting up in downtown uh, or things like that. We have a festival or something going on, and there's lots of people walking around, and we have food trucks set up all over and generators running all over the place. It's just. That's kind of what I'm thinking about it. So we'll and maybe I'm off base, and that's totally, that's totally fine too. Well, we'll look into it, particularly on the electrical safety part of it. Well, and, and I guess uh, as far as the electrical, the the cords and all of that, there's obviously codes about distance and length of cords. So maybe just require the food truck to be within a certain distance if they're going to use the electricity from the primary business. Not only that, and but then this, if they're a certain distance away, of course, then this current one requires extension cords anyway from the generator to the unit. Mm -hmm. The way it's the, the way it's it's already written, we're we're, st we're already using extension cords to to bring electricity to the unit. Well, yes, that, but so, and I would um, assume yeah. there's some type of health or safety <laughs> that has the distance. The generator can't be within mm -hmm. a certain distance of the unit, yeah. so we're already you know kind of dealing with those. I guess it would just be a matter of how to hook those up to a yeah, a business. and we'll we'll look into that. I, it's one just kind of one left coming up. I think from the standpoint of saying you must use a generator versus you can't use business, I think we need to leave that open and let it, the situation decide what's the best combination for it versus here we're saying you have to do this but you can't do this. Let's figure out a way to, to make it work so we can be dynamic because what works over here is probably not going to work there, but let's let's give ourselves some flexibility on this one. The, um, I was going to say really quickly just on that, the as well as the cords i mean a business has you know a 20 amp 110 volt circuit that someone could tie into which i don't know what the energy requirements are of food trucks but something tells me the fire code's not gonna be happy with a big truck plugging into one 20 amp breaker and uh and running good and i think that's this Did you have a question Sons at a track meet, and I decided to take that call. But I just wanted y'all to tell me what you think uh, define what a paved surface is. You keep yeah, reading. Yeah. You keep reading my mind. I'm just going to sit there, and you can come back up here. That. I was going to wait till we get further into the into the some of this stuff, but for mm -hmm. the food for the food uh, court, we're requiring paved surface. Mm -hmm. to be used throughout for all those and so my question was going to come up during that section and in, in that what are we considering um in fact i wrote down definition of what we're considering a paved surface um you know. currently with our code we consider paved surface either an asphalt or a concrete surface okay and we we don't at present have um construction standards for crushed granite or any of those um, alternatives i'll save my question for that till we get to okay. the, the food portal and then the last one is must have an agreement to use a permanent restroom facility within 150 feet of the uh, food vendor. Yeah, yeah. So that, but yeah, basically that means you'd have to be within 150 feet of a building to um, to meet that requirement. Um, I, have a, I have a question. So um, I. Are we talking about sit-down vendors? Because I don't really frequent food trucks, but I usually, when I go to one, grab my food and go. So um, I don't need a restroom facility. So what is the thought process behind having to require a, a restroom facility? I, I get the generator or some type of electricity, of course, but I think in most situations, especially with a single vendor, aren't they just walk up, grab, and go? 
It, it honestly depends. That's, that's some of the fun of trying to craft these mobile food vendor ordinances is you're kind of covering a wide variety. We have the people who want to drive around to construction sites. We have the people who want to drive to McCoy's and Home Depot and stay there an hour. And then we have the people who want to be there 24 seven all the time. So it, it, you've got a full range of what is considered a mobile food vendor and what their business model is for each of those. We have Yoli's across the street that's been there for years. So you have all those different levels and trying to create an ordinance that covers all those. Is I think part of that too was for the employees to have yeah. a place to use the restroom and wash their hands. Which is, yeah. I think that's what and one of the other things that we will do, uh, we're, we'll be, have to meet with the county on the, these rules to make sure we're not in conflict with any of the health district. But the one, we did meet with them initially, and they did bring up that I, that some kind of level of restroom facilities are generally required for restaurants. So that's something we'll run by them too on that requirement. So, does Yoli's have one? I've never paid attention. Uh, they're they're tech actually on the same lot as the laundromat. So I think they're within, because they use the same services as the laundromat. Okay, any questions on the individual? We'll move on to the food court. Okay, so a food court would be, so this, so you could have the primary use on a lot be a food court for multiple vendors. So one of the so kind of where we're going with this, if you read between the two things, we don't want a single person just to set up on a vacant lot, which is one of the requests we get frequently. Well, I just want to go on this corner and be on 95 and sell, but that creates parking problems. It creates other things. So if you're going to have a standalone site, it will be um, need to be the primary use and designed for that use. So a site plan will probably be required to show where each vendor will go, provide you know electricity if they're going to, going to provide the hookups for those units, um, and then also show where they're going to have um, parking or offsite parking that'll be able to reach the site for both the vendors and any uh, potential visitors. At some, it's not been serious conversation, but at times there have been mentions of maybe having food trucks on Saturdays across the street at the farmers mm -hmm. market. Um, and those folks would be there just for a few hours and then leave. I have, I, I think I read in here that there's some consideration for how many, how many hours a truck is going to remain on a site. One hour or less. One hour or less. I don't think, I think it's more than that. Yeah, so that was for construction sites because we have had with our larger developments that are going up around town, we have had people request to, to travel from site to site and sell. And a lot of those are in zoning districts that would not allow food trucks. So our, our uh, new apartments is one. They want a food truck to come feed their guys at lunch and then leave. Mm -hmm. But it's multifamily zoning. So that, that was what that provision was for. But on something like a, if they would ever want to have trucks over there, it would be for like, right now it's four hours. Okay. Um, would they have to do some site des redesign and possibly you know, we'd have to look at that and we can we can look at that example and see how it fits with okay. the rules and then a permanent restroom facility or an agreement to use a permanent restroom facility within 150 feet of the the site would be required on a food court do do we know or do you know off the top of your head what the requirement is for the city of Austin for surfaces for vendor stalls. No, I can, but I can look that yeah. up. My my experience would tell me that it's not a paved surface. You could use a crushed, you know, just, I don't know what it's made up of. What you know, something less permanent than concrete or asphalt. And my thought is that by doing concrete or asphalt, which is expensive, and would limit the ability to at a future date to maybe move, change that side around or would make it very costly to, you know, rip all that up and then re redo it, you know, into something else at a future date. Um, that's my thought. I think, do you have something, do you have a question or are you? No, it's not even Every time you lean up, I feel like you got something to say. So I just want to make sure. It, it's, I've been to some of the ones in Austin and most of them are road-based or decomposed granite. That's, that's it's, my experience. It's almost, I don't think I've seen one yet that's been on an it's actual like concrete around because it's, it's almost like it's, it's permanent, but it's temporary. Like the landlord's going, okay, I'm going to do this for two years because I'm going to put an apartment in here in two years. 
It's that kind of idea that I seem to see. Like I could get rid of all this with a bobcat in a few hours on a Saturday and be good to go versus, you know, I'd have to hire somebody to come up and rip up all the asphalt, all the concrete. So um, not only that, but we add a bunch of impervious cover right. to this this particular area. So one good rain and, and you know, now, we're, now we have, you know, issues with that whole lot that aren't going to drain. So um, my, my thought or my preference uh, for me would be if we could come up with some alternative where you could use paved service if you want, but you could also use something that's not impervious, that's a little bit more economical and that makes future development or redevelopment a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, that's my thought. Just need to make sure that if there is a rain that that ground that cover doesn't go washing down into the drains. So, so what I usually see like in Austin is, you know, it's just for example, say you have like two sets of stones and everything sit inside and they, you know, mash it down and make it, you know, real tight. Yeah. So it's not, it's, there's no wash down. And, that, and that's one of the it. things that we don't, I said we don't have solid standards for that yet. That's right. one of the things that we need to look at with engineering is what would um, comprises of. So permanent facility within 150 feet. Mm -hmm. There's no issue with leave, having a permanent facility on site. Like for they could provide one on site, they or to. they could have an agreement with someone off site. Okay. So if the landowner wants to go through that expensive building, bathrooms on that standalone site, they could do that. Would, would porta potties fall in that permanent restroom facilities? No. Okay. Oh, the other thing, I was, the other note I had here is that on, so on this, we're opting for uh, electricity may be provided or they can use a generator. Mm -hmm. um, I think for food courts, um, where that's the sole purpose of that spot, that we, we should pick one or the other okay. and let everybody be the same for that particular food court, with my preference, obviously, being that there's provided on-site electrical that they can tap into. Um, but, you know, like I said, if we all go to food court and everybody's running on generators, I think we, we run into a, a, a noise issue for the surrounding properties, plus, you know, may not be enjoyable to sit there and hang out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think these will be, these food courts at least, will be really good, you know, as we draw people to downtown. It's fun. You can walk around. You can sit down. You can try different foods and be outside and, and whatnot. I'd hate to ruin that experience, yeah. uh, which is what these provide. And I, and I just, these are kind of some of the examples of food courts that I found. There's one in Fort Worth. Um, and then you, Norwich, Connecticut, they have a big food court apparently. Yeah, so the whole site would not have to be paved, just this actual parking area. So, yeah, so that you'll see that a lot where the trucks move in and out a lot as you get a lot of deep ruts where the trucks park all the time. So I think that's been, that's where a lot of that comes from. Or if they sit there for a really long time, their tires are like, three inches into the dirt. Um, I have a question. So has, what research has been done to, to determine how some of these earlier food trucks or food courts were established? Because it seems like all of a sudden they just kind of started congregating to one area in Austin and all of a sudden there was a food court. And so and if we're going to do something like that here, would someone have to come and say they would like to establish a food court? Or would that begin with one person who has a truck and says they want to start a food court? What would be the process for even establishing a food court and location? So the food court would be de dependent on the property owner. So the pro property owner who owns a piece of property that would fit one of these food courts would be the ones who would have to initiate that. Um, to begin the site plan process or site plan review to see if that was an appropriate, if they can fit the food trucks on and meet all of these requirements. So usually the food courts are a little bit more of an organized, you have, a, you have one person who has the vision for the food court and they maybe contact individual trucks. So the trucks could change out. It's, it's the site and who leases that site basically that would provide the, the services and the, the spots and then the trucks would still the trucks would still have to have their individual permit from us but they would be able to change out as often as they wanted to change out and have we had um enough interested parties um or that you're aware of or that anyone's aware of to where we need to we this would might be something that's 
in the foreseeable future. Definitely. We get probably at least one request every week for food trucks. We've had some requests for, um, yeah, kind of setting up a mobile food court. Uh, we get a lot of interest in this, and right now our answer is we don't really have a clear process on how to get to this stage for them. So There are people that actually want, say I have a piece of property that I, you're getting people that are saying I have a yes. piece of property. Okay, mm -hmm. not just people saying I have a truck and I want to start. We, we have both. We have people that have property that are interested in a food court and we have trucks that are interested in setting up in the Walmart parking lot. So, Is there any, um, has it been discussed at all on public property, the city owning property and sponsoring a food court? No, not for us to initiate a, a food court, a permanent food court, or even temporary food court, no. Let me amend that. There, there actually has been some discussion about uh, possibly creating a food court in either an existing park or a potential future park as a revenue source. But it's still in the talking stage, but it's been discussed. Our existing restaurants might not like that. And, and that's one of the, the concerns you hear. <laughs> and that's really where the trend has come of the mobile food vendors, especially in Austin, is, is they are a low overhead way to start a business. So, oh. I don't want to jump ahead. <clears throat> so are we getting into the rest of this in the next few slides? No. That was oh, that's it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was uh, just trying to hit the high points, and then if you guys have other uh, comments fine. on this section. Um, the, one of the things I noticed on, in the plumbing section was that we were we're saying no connection to water or sewage systems. I'd like to explore changing that for food courts. Part of that is if they're for food courts, yes. The, the part of it is we'll have to make sure we inspect each and every one to make sure they have grease traps. That's that's where we you, we've you, run into the most trouble with food even courts. Even if it's not sewer, but just maybe just water or water or yeah. something. But, yeah, but, but and then we still have to. I think. From my research from other cities, they like to make them be self-contained because it's less inspection especially if these are setting up on the weekends we're not going to have anyone around to inspect or look at the way things are connecting and from the state and county's point of view if it's connected to a sewer system it's not mobile anymore okay um i was looking at the 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 hours of operations so we have uh vendors no vendors outside of 7 to 10 p.m i'm thinking maybe the weekends might be flexible in certain districts for that so we have like you know we try to promote a fun nightlife come and hang out you know yeah if you're like coming out <laughs> coming out and it's like 10 01 and you see him you know leaving for the night it might be nice just, we on, look just at that. on the weekends yeah. honestly the weekdays and it may be more i've seen it in other cities tie it to times for the district so if if it's c2 commercial and then and things the, are uh, open till midnight then yeah. tying into that would be the uh i'd like to know what the thought process would be behind no alcohol sales for food trucks I don't know how that would work with our with the alcohol ordinances. So we have very, we have a very specific map of where alcohol sales are already allowed in town, and then you have to get permits from the city. So it adds another layer of review. Um, I, I'm not actually sure if they can do it without having a fixed location. Or and, and that, like the, so maybe the sites, the food courts may be allowed, but I think. That's so that, I would have that to was get kind a, of my thought. Not not necessarily the guys, you know, setting up in you know the one off at Home Depot, but mm -hmm. but you know if you have a food, the food, court, food court, and we'll look at that. Yeah, um, that that makes this sense. and that may be because so if the food court meets the ordinance as far as location within a school or uh, yeah. something, whatever you mm -hmm. know, whatever that is, if it, if it fits that, then it, it may, and we'll it look at sense. that. I'll look at how that fits in. So. Wouldn't that kind of be like. Um, like it's not like in Louisiana you can walk down the street with alcohol. I, I'm saying open carry in my mind. Open but container. Wouldn't it, <laughs> open container is what open you're thinking. <laughs> well, wouldn't it kind of? Wouldn't that kind of be the conflict? I don't think you're supposed to be. You'd be on private property though. Okay. Open container doesn't. You have to be on like a public street sidewalk or something like that. Yeah, but uh, but. City of Bastrop has a specific alcohol ordinance that has distance requirements from certain things. So we can look at that, and that would be something that maybe a food court could qualify for. I'm not sure a vendor that moves around would be able to qualify for that. So Right. Or it, it may add another layer, but if, if the food court's an authorized site, then if mm -hmm. the vendor's there, they can get an extra 
whatever they need, either from the state or if it yeah. has to be. And what we'll, we'll look at that. We'll have to look at the state state rules on that as well. well last thing, I, last thing I had was on the inspections um, for the health inspector. Um, we have two options for them uh, if a violation is found, and that's either prescribe a reasonable amount of time to correct it, or um, you know, prescribe type of some type of reinspection. Uh, would it make sense to put to let or uh, put an ordinance in there that has the ability to shut it down like then and there? You know, like and we can we can have that as an option. Like, we know, can like look they at walk that up as... and you like drop food on the ground, pick it up and throw it in a you know thing or whatever. <laughs> you know, that, that, yeah, I think putting it in the ordinance that they have the authority to just shut you down, you're done for now. Because um, the way I read this, the only other way to to do that would be for a permit revocation, which requires the city manager or somebody they. Uh, or one of their designees and that there's a whole process for mm -hmm. that so if we have a safety issue or a health concern um, there doesn't appear to be a mechanism in here to shut that down and stop it you know for, for until we can get it fixed and so yeah that's well, just a thought I had we're on still going to meet with the county too to go over right. what they think of yeah actually I would it, for the the health inspection side of it since the county does it for us mm -hmm. I think our ordinance should be county Whatever the county says, that's what we follow. Okay. And we let, since they're doing the inspection, mm -hmm. they wrote it, we just basically point our finger there. Is if they come out and they find something they don't like, they'll shut you down on the spot. They're not shy about that. Is, is that, is that st still applicable inside the city if we have an ordinance that addresses that? Yeah, they're, they're the ones, we have an agreement with them that they do all the health inspections. Okay. So. Anyone else? Well, you wanted our input and you got it. <laughs> you, you get lots of input. In it. Thank you very much. That concludes our agenda. The only thing left is number five. Oh, I'm, thank you. We will now adjourn the workshop and convene back into regular session. Motion to adjourn. Second. We're out of here. Thank you. Done.